I was aware of the North Indian version, then I came across the many different Indian versions, then the Thai, Malaysian, Philippine version, the Burmese, Nepalese versions, and also the fact that it has different faiths, or different faiths claim it as their own. So for me, it's trying to find a way to be respectful to all the faiths, um, and keep true to the basic storyline, but also try and take from these different religions and these different traditions of the story. Um, which was really exciting, actually. So, I could, in a sense, I could get the best Ramayana there is by taking all the best bits and putting them together. It's, essentially, it's a two-part story. The first part is Vishnu being incarnated on Earth as Rama, Rama growing up and then meeting Sita and marrying her. And then the second part really is about Rama's exile into the forest and, and his wife comes along with him, as does his brother. But then his wife's abducted by this supposed demon, Ravana, and then Rama has to go into battle against Ravana to win back his wife. And then there's a few more little twists and turns at the end, so it's not just a very happy, hunky-dory story, there's a few little twists there. But, but very similar to Aeneid, I guess, in a way, a sense of, you know, the wife, wife being abducted, husband going to win back wife. Um, I guess there are probably historical parallels, and some of the academic research I did sort of suggests that merchants are probably exchanging stories um, you know, several thousand years ago, which is wonderful. So in a sense for me, um, to have the, the echoes of the, of the Greeks now is also probably reflective of what happened a few thousand years ago. I think we're starting to realise that much more and more, aren't we, that the East-West stories are probably linked and they, they are probably world stories. Because it's originally an oral story and I grew up with it as a child, um, in the oral tradition there, there is sort of, you know, a bit of bounce, a bit of humour, um, partly to make it appealing to children. Um, and when I came across the, the versions as an adult, some of them felt very sincere and very serious, like, a bit like the Greek translations, you know, very dour and very earnest. And that wasn't really the spirit I felt the Rama, Ramayana had had for me. So I wanted to inject a bit of kind of life into it, make it as lively as possible. And humour is one way to inject an extra element of life. When I write it, I'm very much thinking about the music on the page. But I'm always aware of this interface between oral and written. And I'm very into kind of very musical structures and, um, and I want the majority of it to be really loud and lively. Um, so hopefully the reader will mouth the words and act them out. I'm just going to read from my prologue. Um, and in the prologue, um, Ravana, one of the gods, has acquired masses of power. Um, and the other gods have gone to complain to Vishnu about him because uh, he's wrecking their, their worlds, their kingdoms on Earth and in the universe. So this section is called Prologue, Get Ravana. Lord of the cosmos Vishnu was brought back to heaven from a stellar meditation by many gods now stooped at his feet. Said one, semi-stooped in the saffron light, O oh Lord, whilst we in thousand-day prayers for peace are bent, Ravana is bish-boshing our kingdoms. Another god butted in. O oh Lord, with only a wink, he splash even our oceans into a coma. No wonder the gods were gurgling with collywobbles. Ravana was toasting their earthly and galactic worlds. By soaking the energy from everything he nulled, Ravana was now a supreme being becoming. But who was this scallywag, this Gunda? Lord of the cosmos Vishnu flashed umpteen visions to the gods that showed Ravana's path to glory. In the first flashback, Vishnu displayed Ravana being born with 10 heads and 10 pairs of arms. Then he showed Ravana, the teenager, on a hillock, meditating for so many non-stop years that smoke was issuing from his head and dulling the heavens. The gods were constrained and had to grant Ravna great mental and physical powers known as boons. So many boons empowering Ravna that he could fly through the air on the power of a thought alone. Yet Ravna hankered after more boons, so many boons that even Vishnu, according to natural law, had to hand them over. Vishnu showed Ravana earning these boons by fasting atop a mountain, dining only on the air's moisture for a hundred years. Boon-packed, rock-hard Ravana was now shown standing on a toe 
without shifting a muscle through heat wave or whirlwind. One tough nut toe while simultaneously reciting Vishnu's beloved mantra, Om. for 900 solid years. No surprise, in Vishnu's next vision, Ravana was losing his mind and was holding a blade to cut off his own ten heads. Vishnu from on high stopped him by asking what he is wanting. Ravana boomed back, Am I not a worthy king of the universe, Lord? Vishnu must have hoped Ravana would become pure Shanti, a bit like himself. Yet soon, as Vishnu's divine engine touched across each Ravana atom, in a somewhat unparalleled way, Ravana went bonkers. His ten heads, his ten sets of arm, trapezoid, rump, knuckle and whatnot juddered tsunami, juddered tsunami volcanically into a hardcore fierce firming up. His every millionch was muscling, pinnacling with indestructibility